हेलो नमस्कार दिस इज फर्स्ट पोस्ट एंड यू वाचिंग वॉचिंग विद मी पलकी शर्मा We begin with the latest episode of the Trudeau versus India saga. If you thought it was dying down, well think again. A new report is out. It says India has asked Canadian diplomats to leave. Not one or two, but 41 of them. 41 diplomats have been asked to leave. They must leave in a week. That's what the report says. Neither New Delhi nor Ottawa has confirmed this. But more importantly, neither side has denied this. What does it mean? Is this an escalation? We'll bring you the details and our analysis. In other news, Iron Brothers China and Pakistan are at odds. Beijing has rejected Islamabad's proposals for investment. India has sent a senior intelligence official as the National Security Advisor of Mauritius. It's a unique arrangement. We'll bring you the backstory and the strategic significance of this. Controversy over the Nobel Prize for Medicine, an American university is being slammed for claiming credit. A football match between Iran and Saudi Arabia was cancelled over the statues of Qasim Soleimani, the slain general. The US military is struggling to recruit young people and it's turning to TikTok. The Catholic Church may bless same-sex couples. With this statement, the Pope has once again said the cat among the pigeons. And would you pay $6,000 for a pair of knickers? We'll explain why we ask the headlines first. A shooting at a mall in Thailand's capital, Bangkok, kills at least two injures over five. A 14-year-old suspect has been arrested. Hundreds fled the upmarket Siam Paragon Mall as shots were fired around 5 p.m. local time. After the Philippines, Thailand has the second highest rate of gun homicides in Southeast Asia. Is the grain war between Ukraine and Poland ending? They've struck a deal on Ukrainian grain transit. The exports from Kiev will be taken through Poland to other countries. Poland has had banned imports of Ukrainian grain, triggering a diplomatic spat. Armenia moves a step closer to joining the International Criminal Court, escalating tensions with Russia. Moscow says Yerevan's decision is wrong. In March, the ICC had issued an arrest warrant for President Putin over the Ukraine war. Armenia is upset over Russia's inaction in Nagorno-Karabakh. Seychelles opposition leader charged with witchcraft, Patrick Armini, who is now out on bail, calls the case politically motivated. He's the head of the United Seychelles Party. He plans to run in the 2025 presidential election. And the, the U.S. issues its first ever space junk penalty. Dish Network has to pay $150,000. They failed to deorbit their Echo Star 7 satellite, which has been in space for more than two decades. Space junk is made up of bits of tech that are in orbit around the Earth, but no longer in use. In crisis, you have two options. You can either react to what's happening or you can take initiative. It's a rule that applies in all crises, personal, political and diplomatic. And with Canada, it seems India has chosen option number two, taking initiative, being proactive. Reports say New Delhi is asking dozens of Canadian diplomats to leave the country. Around 41 of them, they've been asked to leave and apparently there is a deadline. Leave by October 10th or lose your diplomatic immunity. That's India's message to Canada. Now, what is diplomatic immunity? It's like a shield for diplomats. Imagine you are India's envoy stationed in Canada. The Canadian laws will not apply to you. You cannot be charged, arrested or prosecuted. Hence, immunity. India is reportedly threatening to revoke that shield. Not for one or two, but 41 Canadian diplomats. Now, we don't have official confirmation about this. Neither country has said anything. Just a short while back, though, Justin Trudeau was asked about this report, and he refused to confirm it. He says Canada does not want to escalate. Same thing that he said last week. But India has talked about this possibility before. Listen to this. Um, yes, we have informed the Canadian government that there should be parity um, in strength and rank equivalence in our diplomatic uh, presence, in mutual diplomatic presence. Um, their numbers here are much, are very much higher than ours in Canada. The details of this are being worked out. 
but I assume there will be a reduction uh, from the Canadian side. Couple of things to note here. One, India had concerns about Canada's diplomatic strength. In other words, they had too many people in India and this concern was conveyed to Canada. When was this? Well, the press conference was on the 21st of September, so I assume before that. Canada was told about this before that. More than 10 days have passed, but Canada is yet to act. They're not reducing their strength voluntarily. Is that why India has issued this deadline? Well, we can't be sure, which brings us to the second point. Why does Canada have so many people here in India? Reports say there are 62 Canadian diplomats in India. Their justification is this. Around 1.3 million Canadians claim Indian heritage. They also have families in India, so Canada's consular section is loaded. But India says it's unnecessary. We have around 20 diplomats stationed in Canada. So New Delhi wants parity, equal number of diplomats for both countries. And this could be a problem for Canada. There are four diplomatic missions in India, the High Commission in New Delhi, plus three consulates. Will they be able to operate these with just 20 officials? Or will they have to shut some of them? I know it sounds technical, but the truth is, it's all political. This controversy had largely faded in the last couple of days. Justin Trudeau was dialing down. He called for closer relations with India. So what explains this new development? Honestly, it's hard to say at this point. The Indian government has refused to comment on the matter. The Canadians are silent as well, at least officially. Anonymous Canadian officials have confirmed these reports, but they haven't said anything about the timing. Is this a new order by New Delhi? Or is it one of India's long-standing concerns? Either way, it shows two things. One, this controversy is not dying down. It's being played in the shadows with leaks, counter-leaks and anonymous officials. And two, India is standing firm. You don't ask diplomats to leave during damage control. So New Delhi is not backing down. And why should it? What Canada is doing is shoot and scoot. Justin Trudeau claimed in Parliament that there were credible allegations. His ally Jagmeet Singh went a step ahead. He said there was clear evidence. Just one problem though, no one else has seen it. Canada is yet to show the smoking gun, if at all they have it. Instead, Justin Trudeau has been leaking things to Canadian media. One leak says they have details of conversations. Between whom? Indian diplomats. Apparently, these conversations point to India's involvement. If that is the case indeed, why not release the conversations? Again, there is no official explanation. All we have are unofficial leaks. And according to them, Canada is protecting its sources. Also, their methods were shady. They may have snooped on Indian diplomats in Canada, and Justin Trudeau knows all of this. He knew his alleged evidence could not be shared. Yet he took on India. He wanted the world to take his word for it. Unfortunately, that is not how diplomacy works. When Trudeau attacked, India responded in kind. Canada's intelligence officer was expelled, visa services were cancelled, and diplomats were asked to leave. It's important to note that these are all temporary moves. If Canada wants, they can make amends. But well, will Justin Trudeau do that? That is the question. He can't keep backing down, not after making an allegation like he did. But without Western support, he doesn't have much wiggle room either. It's a very fine line for the Canadian Prime Minister between putting pressure and not escalating. India, though, is standing firm. It is sending a message to Canada. You can't just fling wild allegations and disappear. You must back it up. So this latest move shows India's confidence. But is it the right call? Well, so far, it's gone well. In the long run, as they say, only time will tell. Our next story comes from Pakistan. Its iron brotherhood with China is corroding. And the reason is the Belt and Road Initiative, BRI. It is testing the China-Pakistan relationship. Let me explain how. Recently, Pakistan approached China. It wanted more investment, more infrastructure projects. And China said no. It doesn't want to put more money into CPEC. CPEC is the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, CPEC. It's the showpiece of Belt and Road. It's a massive infrastructure undertaking, a dream project for Xi Jinping and a dead trap for Pakistan. CPEC is one of the reasons why Islamabad needed a bailout. Pakistan took many loans. They were used to fund CPEC projects. But over the years, this debt became unsustainable. For perspective, let me give you a figure. 
30% of Pakistan's debt is owed to China, 30%. As of February this year, Pakistan's external debt stood at about $100 billion. $100 billion, that's what they owe to the world. Out of this, $30 billion was owed to China. And a big chunk of this debt is due to CPEC. Pakistan owed about $10 billion to China just for the Gwadar port. This is as per an assessment in 2019. Now, all this debt led to Pakistan's economic collapse last year. But they don't seem to have learned any lessons. Despite the massive debt, Pakistan wants to expand CPEC. It wants more Chinese projects and, by extension, more Chinese loans. Now, what kind of projects are these? Four categories have been identified. Energy, climate change, power transmission lines and tourism. Pakistan wants projects in these four sectors. And they also came with a list of locations. Gilgit Baltistan, Khyber Pakhtunwa, Pakistan occupied Kashmir and some coastal areas of Pakistan. That's where they wanted Chinese investment. So Islamabad approached Beijing with a list. They had a meeting. China heard Pakistan's proposals and it rejected all of them. We don't have access to Pakistan's complete wish list, but here's what we can tell you. One of the proposals was a transmission line, infrastructure to supply electricity. Pakistan wanted to build it for Gwadar. It proposed a 500 kilovolt line, starting from the Gwadar port and ending in Karachi. And Karachi is where Pakistan has its national power grid. So this transmission line would connect the Gwadar port to the national grid. It's a good idea on paper, but it did not fly because China refused to participate. The Pakistani press is discussing this. Reports say China is reluctant to put more money into Pakistan. They've already invested more than $60 billion into CPEC. They do not want to spend any more. Islamabad, on its part, has rubbished such reports. Recently, a statement was issued. It came from Pakistan's planning ministry. I have a copy of the statement. This is what it says. China and Pakistan are committed to expanding the scope of CPEC to include new areas of cooperation, such as water resources management, climate change, and tourism. So Pakistan insists that they will expand CPEC. And what has China said? Well, nothing so far. Silence. And this is fueling more speculation. Do you know when this meeting happened, the one where these projects were discussed? This meeting took place in October 2022, one year ago. Officials from China and Pakistan met. They had significant disagreements. They dis their discussions continued into 2023, that is this year. And finally, in July this year, both sides gave up. That is when officials signed the minutes of the meeting. The minutes, as you would know, is the final summary of talks. It's an official record of the discussion. It describes what happened, who said what, and all kinds of details. Now, usually these minutes are wrapped up quickly, but in this case, it took nine months because Pakistan continued to pursue China, and China refused to open the purse strings. You may ask why. What are Beijing's apprehensions? In the month of August, Xi Jinping had hailed CPEC. The project had completed 10 years, and the Chinese president spoke on the occasion. He said he wanted to work with Pakistan. He wanted to upgrade CPEC. But it seems Beijing has had a rethink, because they face multiple challenges in Pakistan. The biggest one, of course, is political stability, or the lack of it. Even though the army runs the country, their authority is being challenged. Pakistan should have gone to polls next month. Now it will have elections next year. Until then, a caretaker government is in charge. So now is not a good time to start new projects. China would want to see how the chips fall. Then there are issues like losses and debt. China is wary of making more bad bets. Many of their investments have already turned sour. For example, their power companies. Pakistan owes them a lot of money, about $1.2 billion as of 2022. And these are overdue payments. Do you know how Pakistan proposed to pay these bills, $1.2 billion? By taking more loans from China. As of last week, these bills were still pending. So China has not bailed out Pakistan. It does not want more losses. The second problem is security. Pakistan is not safe for the Chinese. They're being targeted by Pakistani militants. Two months back, Chinese engineers were hit. Their convoy in Balochistan was attacked. Pakistan's military managed to repel the attackers. None of the, none of the Chinese workers were hurt there. But the others were not so lucky. Last year, there was a suicide bombing. It happened in Karachi. Three Chinese teachers were killed. This was a deliberate 
and premeditated suicide terrorist attack against Chinese citizens. The terrorists targeted teachers who are successors of the human civilization and facilitators of cultural exchange in a very bad and heinous manner. China expresses its strong condemnation and great indignation. So Chinese nationals in Pakistan are under attack. Beijing wants more security. Islamabad is failing to provide it. Consider what happened recently. China's vice premier visited Pakistan in July. A special route was prepared for him. It was guarded by 2,700 policemen for the Chinese vice premier, 2,700 cops. But on the day of the visit, there was another attack, another suicide bombing. A political rally was targeted, 44 people died. The rally was in Khyber Pakhtunwa. That's another key province for CPEC because China has put a lot of money there. They have multiple investments in Khyber Pakhtunwa. Was this attack linked to the visit? It is believed so. It was like a warning to Beijing, a warning against future investments. And China seems to be paying heed. It cannot do a U-turn here, but it can certainly go slow and it can most certainly reject Pakistan's proposals. Some trivia now. Did you know that Mauritius has an Indian national security advisor? And I don't mean Indian origin, I mean an Indian citizen. It's an arrangement that goes back decades. New Delhi handpicks the Mauritian NSA. How strange is that? Can you imagine an, a non-Indian as India's national security advisor or a non-American as the US NSA? It's unthinkable. So why does Mauritius keep doing it? We'll get to that in a bit, but first, meet the new National Security Advisor of Mauritius. Report say it's this man, Vivek Jory. He's a senior intelligence officer. He's already worked extensively in India's neighborhood. His next posting is Port Louis. It's the capital of Mauritius. The man he's replacing is also an Indian official. Kumarisan Ilango. He's a 1982 batch IPS officer. He had retired as second in command at RAW. That's the Research and Analysis Wing. It's India's spy agency. Now, this arrangement is very important for India. Most of us may know Mauritius as a holiday destination, but there's a lot more at play. For instance, its location. Mauritius is located in the Western Indian Ocean. It is 65 kilometers long and 45 kilometers wide, so it's pretty small. But strategically, it is very important, sort of like a launch pad to Africa. China has been increasing its influence in the Western Indian Ocean. They already have a base in Djibouti, in the Horn of Africa. But Mauritius has been a firm Indian ally, and one reason for that is shared ethnicity. Around 68% of all Mauritians are of Indian origin. 48% of them are Hindus, and that includes their Prime Minister, Praveen Jugnot. There is an Indian cultural centre in this country, also the World Hindi Secretariat. The relations are pretty deep. India trains Mauritian security officials. We also fund dozens of projects on the island. Just last year, a major deal was announced. India promised to invest $500 million on a metro project. Plus, New Delhi is the first responder. When things go wrong, Mauritius reaches out to India first. Whether it's a pandemic, an oil spill, or a natural disaster, India has always been the first to arrive. Is that why Mauritius has an Indian NSA? Well, not really. The answer to that lies in the country's history. Mauritius became independent in the year 1968. Until then, it was a British colony, 1968. A few years later, in 1974, they signed a security deal with India. From then, the military exchange began. And things were fine until 1982. Elections were held that year. A new coalition government came to power in Mauritius. And the prime minister was this man, Anirudh Jugnot, the father of the current prime minister. Soon, divisions emerged within the coalition. Jugnot faced a rival within his own party, a man called Paul Berenger. So in 1983, Jugnot travelled to India. He had a meeting with Prime Minister Indira Gandhi. His objective? To get military support from India, and he was successful. Indira Gandhi approved Operation Lal Dora. The plan was to land Indian troops in Mauritius. It never happened, though. The Army and Navy could not decide on how to do it, on who would lead the operation. So the military plan, Lal Dora, was paused. Instead, New Delhi opted for covert operations. The raw chief was dispatched to Mauritius. His job was to mobilize the Indian origin community, and he was successful. 
Anirudh Jugnot retained his chair. He later requested India to send a national security advisor. And New Delhi sent one, General J.N. Tamini. He was the Indian Army's chief liaison officer with RAW, and since then, all Mauritian NSAs have been Indian. It's a very unique arrangement, one that signifies the importance of the relationship. India invited Mauritius to the G20 summit as well. Prime Minister Jugnot met Prime Minister Modi at his residence. Only two other leaders got such a reception. U.S. President Joe Biden and Bangladesh Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina. They met Prime Minister Modi at his residence. All other meetings were held at the G20 summit venue. So clearly, it's a special relationship and it's a mutually beneficial setup. But is it also a popular one? Not always. Last year, there was a major snooping scandal in Mauritius. The opposition blamed the Indian NSA for it. They questioned why the arrangement continued. Prime Minister Jugnot stuck by New Delhi. He slammed the opposition for what he called India bashing. So the government of Mauritius is still on board and it's important to keep it that way because in the race for the Indo-Pacific, Mauritius will play an important role and their security is linked to India's security. It's that time of the year. The Nobel Prizes are being announced. Yesterday, the winners of the medicine category were revealed. A team of two scientists, Catalin Carrico, and Drew Wiesman. They were awarded for their work on mRNA vaccines. Their research led to this path-breaking technology. But now there is a row, a controversy over who gets credit for this achievement. In an ideal world, there shouldn't even be a question. The scientists deserve all the praise and credit. But in this case, one more party is claiming credit, the University of Pennsylvania. It's an Ivy League institution. This is where these scientists did their research. And now the university is claiming credit. Look at their statement. Catalin Carrico and Drew Wiesman, Penn's historic mRNA vaccine research team, win 2023 Nobel Prize in Medicine. A historic achievement indeed. But here's what the university did not say in the statement. They pushed Carrico out of their team. She's one of the winners. The university forced her to retire some time back. Ten years ago, I was here in October <laughs> because I was kicked out yeah? Yeah. Yeah. from yeah. Penn. I <laughs> yeah. was forced to retire. You heard what she said. Let me tell you the full story. In the 1990s, Kariko was at the Penn University. She was having a rough time. Her bosses were running out of patience. Funding for her research had dried up. She was studying the same subject, the potential of mRNA vaccines. The technology was for which she's got the Nobel Peace Prize, the Nobel Prize for Medicine, sorry. She was studying this and she was researching it. Back in the 90s, Penn University did not see merit in the idea. They refused to allocate more funds for this research. Kariko tried to come up with alternatives. She reached out to external donors, but it did not help. So Penn gave her two options, leave the university or accept a demotion. It was an insult. Kariko was on course to becoming a full professor. Now, Americans have the system called tenure. It basically means a lifetime job. And it gives strong protections and benefits. So achieving tenure is like getting a guarantee. If you become a professor, you never lose your job, unless, of course, it's an extreme case. So you have a lifetime guarantee of sorts. But the path to full professorship is extremely tough. It takes up to 10 years to get there. And Kariko was almost there. But then Penn University demoted her. They lowered her rank. In 2013, she had a new job offer from the pharma company BioNTech. They offered her the post of senior vice president, and she took it. And when she was preparing to leave, she was humiliated by Penn officials. Listen to this. This is Kariko describing her ordeal, and I'm quoting. They told me that they'd had a meeting and concluded that I was not of faculty quality. When I told them that I was leaving, they laughed at me and said BioNTech doesn't even have a website. Well, she left anyway, and as it turns out, she had the last laugh. Her move enabled her to continue the research, and now, after the pandemic, mRNA technology is mainstream. Pfizer joined hands with BioNTech to make the Wuhan virus vaccine. It is based on the same mRNA technology. Its success has made BioNTech a household name. Despite all of this, Penn did not have a change of heart.
A few years back, Kariko re returned to research and she rejoined the same university, Penn University, but she was not reinstated with a former title. She's working as an adjunct professor, while her colleague and fellow Nobel laureate, Wiesman, serves as the director of vaccine research. Now, to add insult to injury, the university has rushed to claim credit for her achievement. The scientific community is slamming Penn for this. They're seeking an apology and a promotion for Kariko. We do hope she gets it. And as the world congratulates her, there's also a lesson in her story on why it's important to stay the course. You see, scientific research is never easy. It takes years for researchers to first find a worthy idea, then many more years to produce tangible results. Along the way, they grapple with challenges like funding and securing a place to support their efforts. Even with the right tools, there is always the risk of failure. You may dedicate your life to a subject or a quest and come up with nothing. These challenges deter many students from taking up research as a career path, but these challenges also end in success stories. Whether it is a Nobel Prize for Catalin Carrico or the success of scientists at ISRO, they serve as a lesson. Perseverance wins. What's the worst thing about live sports? When matches get cancelled. It happens all the time, sometimes because of bad weather, sometimes because of security scares. But in Iran, a match has been called off because of a statue, a bust rather. The match was supposed to be a big deal. Saudi club Al Itihad was taking on Iranian club Sepahan. They were playing in the Iranian city of Isfahan. At least they were supposed to play. But the Saudi club refused to leave their dressing room. Why? Because of this bust. That's Iranian military commander Qasim Soleimani. He headed the Iranian Quds force. He's a bit of a legend in the country. Because Soleimani was the ultimate spy master, he handled all the Iranian proxies, the Hezbollah in Lebanon, the Houthis in Yemen, and the Hamas in Gaza. But for the US and its allies, he was a threat. Washington designated Qasim Soleimani as a terrorist in 2018, and two years later, they killed him. His vehicle was hit by an airstrike in Baghdad. Iranians were enraged. Thousands of them marched with portraits of Soleimani. They also called for revenge, but nothing happened. Tehran attacked a U.S. base in neighboring Iraq, but the damage was negligible. So Soleimani's death is unfinished business for Iran. But where does Saudi Arabia come in? Well, Riyadh was no fan of his. Soleimani's proxies had also attacked their oil shipments. They even targeted cities and refineries. So the Saudi press was pretty happy when he died. They didn't kill him, but they did not complain. Back to match day now. Why did Iran install these statues ahead of the game? Tehran says they did not. And they claimed that the bus were always there that the Saudi team had even practiced in front of these statues. Either way, it sums up relations between the two countries, precarious at best. You see, Iran and Saudi Arabia are regional rivals. They have their own Cold War going on. Saudi Arabia is the Sunni power, Iran is the Shia power. Things escalated in 2016, that is when Iranian militants attacked the Saudi embassy in Tehran. Soon, normal relations were cut off. But earlier this year, there were some positive signs. Iran and Saudi Arabia signed a normalization deal. It was negotiated by China. They also reopened embassies after a gap of seven years. Many called it a reset. In fact, that deal paved the way for this match. After 2016, Saudi and Iranian clubs played at neutral venues, no home or away games. But this year, they agreed to host each other. Saudi club Al Nasar was the first to play in Iran. Their talisman, Cristiano Ronaldo, was part of the squad. The fans were expecting more action on Monday. Around 60,000 of them had packed into the Isfahan Stadium. What they got was disappointment. Many of them chanted, keep politics out of sports. I'm afraid it's not that easy, certainly not in West Asia. You can make all the progress you want to, but all it takes is one wrong move. The Saudi-Iran relationship is a perfect example of that. After the normalization deal, they made some good progress. Houthi rebels visited Saudi Arabia last month. On the agenda was a ceasefire in Yemen. Riyadh said the talks were good. 
They also extended an invite to Iranian President Ibrahim Raisi, and Raisi said he welcomes the invite. His government is also considering proposals to expand cooperation with the Saudis. And one of them is cancelling visas. Can you imagine that? Visa-free travel between Saudi Arabia and Iran. It sounds like the perfect reset. But differences remain, and one of them is Israel. Saudi Arabia is inching closer to recognizing Israel. On Monday, an Israeli delegation traveled to Saudi Arabia. It was headed by their communication minister. Last week, another Israeli minister traveled to Saudi Arabia. So recognition is coming. It's not a question of when. No, it's, it's a question of when, rather, and not if. But Iran is not happy about that. Their president blasted Riyadh for moving closer to Israel. He called it regressive and reactionary. And don't mistake this for activism. This is pure political thinking. Why do you think Arab nations are recognizing Israel? Economic gains are just a part of it. The bigger objective is to isolate Iran or to contain it at the very least. To create a broad West Asian alliance against Tehran. And Saudi Arabia is doing the same. Reports say they're asking for a military deal with the US, sort of like NATO. They want Washington to defend the kingdom if attacked. Who do you think that deal is aimed at? Again, Iran. So the Saudi-Iran reset faces multiple challenges. Their current detente is a convenient one. One that enables them to regroup and strategize. Not one that buries old differences. Now to the United States, where the army is facing its most formidable foe. No, it's not China. It's not even Russia. It's Gen Z. You heard that right? Those born between 1996 and 2010. That's what Gen Z stands for. The generation known for TikTok and avocado toasts. And now their lukewarm response to combat boots. Gen Z does not want to join the U.S. Army, and this is causing a recruitment crisis. Some context first. The U.S. military ended its draft system in 1973. Before that, serving in the military was compulsory in America. After 1973, it became voluntary. Fifty years have passed since. And now the U.S. military is facing its worst recruitment crisis in history. Just look at the numbers. They're failing to meet recruitment targets. The signs have been there for a while, but this year the numbers are particularly bad. The Army is expected to fall short by 15,000 recruits, the Navy by 10,000, and the Air Force by 3,000 recruits. So all three branches are falling short by around 28,000 people. Now, the U.S. military has 1.4 million active personnel. So a deficit of 30-odd thousand recruits may not look like a big deal, but the Pentagon does not think so. This is the world's third largest army we're talking about. A dip in the numbers could hinder their defenses. But what explains the shortfall? Well, some traditional factors like a strong job market and better incentives in the private sector. But the biggest factor is Gen Z. They're simply not interested in military service. The Pentagon even conducted a survey about this. It talked to young adults. Only 9% of them said they would consider service. That's the lowest level since 2007. Only 9%. Military leaders say they're struggling to hit targets. That's because most of the potential recruits do not meet their standards. Data shows that young people are simply not interested. They do not see a future in the armed forces. Critics say this is lack of patriotism. But America's Gen Z begs to differ. They say it's, the, it's a lack of old-fashioned patriotism. For them, serving a nation is not just about joining the army. There are other avenues, like social service or political activism, and it turns out they're more inclined towards that. Plus, there's economic stability. A strong job market has been historically associated with low recruitment for the military. And currently, the U.S. job market is doing well. This makes the Army's benefits look less attractive. So it's no surprise what the youth are choosing. Also, there's lack of awareness. Most of them do not really know how time in the Army is actually spent or what the benefits are. So in 2018, the U.S. Army launched a marketing campaign. They invested about $4 billion in marketing. This is a 10-year plan to attract the youth. But so far, that effort has come up short. Gen Z is still opting out. And even if they want to serve, many fail to qualify. They do not make the cut when it comes to physical and mental health. 
Most of them are overweight. This is according to John Hopkins. It talks about Americans between 18 and 25 years of age. More than half of them are overweight, so they cannot enlist. Plus, a record number of young people have mental disorders. They seek therapy. In the US, that's immediate disqualification from service. So even if Gen Z wants, they cannot serve, and that's saying something. So what's the army doing about this? Well, they're not changing the rules for now, but they're venturing into the world of TikTok and Discord with videos like these. Get ready with me for a day in service, or a video that says, know your army. Basically, the US military is trying everything. Several branches have also increased recruitment payouts, more incentives to lure people. It hasn't really worked yet, but there's something that has. A recent decision by the US Air Force, and listen to this, they have relaxed rules on hand and neck tattoos, also on past marijuana use. You will not be disqualified for that if you've used it in the past. And this has boosted numbers. Maybe that's the key. While life in the army is all about discipline and living by the rules, perhaps some of those rules need an update. Like in this day and age, seeking therapy cannot be seen as a weakness. Should you be disqualified from service because of it? It's a point to ponder. They can also cast a wider net, focus on diversity. America allows women and the LGBT community to serve in the military, but their numbers have been historically low. So maybe they could work on that. The US military was once an institution. It inspired tales of heroism and duty, at least for Hollywood it did. But now those tales are falling on the deaf ears of Gen Z. If the army has to survive, it will have to adapt. Tomorrow is a big day for the Catholic Church. The Vatican will hold a global gathering of bishops. They will discuss the future of the church. A number of hot button issues are on the agenda, like prevention of abuse in the church, promotion of women to priesthood, and inclusion of homosexual Catholics. The last bit being the most polarizing one. Same-sex relationships are considered a sin by the Catholic Church. Now, ahead of tomorrow's meeting, Pope Francis has made a statement. He said same-sex unions could be blessed by Catholic priests. This is a first. It's a radical shift, also a non-committal one. Because the key word here is could. They could do it. The Pope has merely teased the idea. They could bless same-sex couples, but the Church will not recognize such marriages. How does that work? Our next report tells you. This is the German Catholic Church. It's long been known for pushing the boundaries of its faith. It has shown willingness to reconsider the church's stance on various issues, including those on celibacy and the LGBTQ community. And in March this year, it allowed same-sex unions to receive blessings by Catholic priests. In Germany, there will be blessing celebrations for couples who love each other. Blessing celebrations with the blessing of the church. Now queer couples who love each other and people who bless them in the name of the church are coming out of the grey area of the forbidden into the bright field of faith. It was an act of love for love. But in the eyes of the Vatican, it was sedition. A direct defiance of the Vatican's decree which says that same-sex unions should not be celebrated or recognized. According to the Catholic Church, same-sex relationships are a sin. The German Catholic Church stirred up a debate. For months, 1.3 billion Catholics pondered over it. They passionately argued, wondering if the German Church was simply being disobedient or if it was showing a different path. And now they finally have their answer. In a first, Pope Francis has suggested that people in same-sex relationships could be blessed by Catholic priests. This could be taken on a case-by-case -case basis, meaning it will be subjective and it could be allowed. So long as the blessings don't imply a same-sex union is equivalent to a heterosexual marriage. God forbid that happens. The Pope clarified further. He said that the church still considered same-sex marriages objectively sinful and they would not recognize the unions. To many, the Pope's suggestion sounds half-hearted, but for the church, this is a big step.
You see, homosexuality is a controversial matter for the Vatican. It's contributed to a deepening polarization. And the church has been divided between progressive and conservative ideologies. The Pope, it seems, has been batting for both sides. He's spoken for the inclusion of the queer community and at the same time, he repeatedly called same-sex marriages a sin. Just this year, he said he could not bless same-sex marriages because he could not bless sin. So his recent suggestion is a complete role reversal. What's also interesting is the timing. His comment comes just a day ahead of the Vatican's big meeting. Tomorrow, bishops and lay people from the world over will meet to discuss the future of the Catholic Church. They will talk about matters that have long been considered off-limits. They will discuss accountability measures. So there are more checks on how bishops exercise their authority. This comes after calls to prevent abuses in church. Promotion of women to decision-making roles will also be considered. If agreed to, the Vatican will have female priests. The third hot topic is, of course, that of homosexuality. It remains unclear if and when the church will accept it. The pontiff's statements have clearly inflamed tensions. But they've also made room for hope, because with a mere suggestion, the Pope has softened the Vatican's ban on gay blessings. Let's tell you more about hypocrisy. This story features the European Union. They're struggling with a migrant crisis. Most of these migrants come from Africa, so the EU decided to hire a bouncer, not a person or a group, but an entire country. Europe decided to pay Tunisia to keep migrants out. Now, Tunisia is a North African country. It's where most migrants gather to leave for Europe. The EU promised them money to stop these migrants. Now Tunisia is playing hardball. Their president is a man called Kai Saied. Yesterday he played his hand. He refused to take funding from Europe. He said it wasn't enough money. And his refusal threatens to aggravate Europe's crisis. You see, Tunisia holds the key to stemming the migrant flow. It's an important transit country along with neighboring Libya. Hundreds of migrants leave Tunisian shores every day, hoping to cross the Mediterranean into Europe. These migrants are overwhelming the continent, and Tunisia is using them as human bargaining chips with the EU. Their president wants money from Europe. He calls it Development Fund. Critics say it will only consolidate his autocratic rule. But Europe turned a blind eye to this criticism. They wanted to keep the migrants away. Democracy could wait. So in the month of June this year, the EU agreed to a deal. They promised to send almost a billion dollars in aid to Tunisia. The European Commission is considering macrofinancial assistance as soon as the necessary agreement is found. And we are ready to mobilize up to 900 million euros for this purpose of macrofinancial assistance. As an immediate step, we could provide an additional up to 150 million euros in budget support right now. President Said was supposed to stop migrants, prevent them from using Tunisia as a departure point for Europe. In exchange, he would get the money. This was the deal. It was a simple, if morally questionable, transaction. Because Said has been accused of weakening democracy, of jailing his opponents, and of concentrating power with himself. The usual moves of a dictator. The kind of stuff that Europe is quick to slam. They lecture the world about democratic values, but in this case, Europe did not care. They wanted his help to stem the flow of migrants, and they were willing to pay the autocrat for his services. Said, on his part, has been smart about all of this. He's balancing the migrant deal with domestic opinion. He has not directly said that he's helping Europe. Tunisia could not guard borders other than its own, and we do not accept becoming a settlement country. He says Tunisia will only guard its own borders. But then he cracks down on migrants in the country. We were lying down and suddenly saw the police arrive to take us away. We started running. We didn't know where to go. Tunisia has used inhumane methods to deal with migrants, like rounding them up and leaving them at the border with Libya. But again, it seems Europe doesn't care.
In July, European leaders signed a strategic partnership with Tunisia. Then last month, Europe announced the first tranche of funding. Announcing uh, 60 million in budget support for Tunisia and an operational assistance package uh, on migration worth around 67 million euro, which will uh, be dispersed, um, which will be dispersed uh, um, in the coming days, contracted and delivered swiftly. She announced roughly 133 million dollars worth of funding. About 63 million was for budget support, and that's where the deal seems to have soured. In June, Europe had promised almost a billion dollars in assistance. You can imagine that Said was not happy with a meager 63 million. Yesterday, he decided to reject the package. He said, and I'm quoting here, Tunisia rejects what the EU announced, not because of the small amount, but because the proposal conflicts with the memorandum of understanding signed in July. His statement puts Europe in a bind because illegal migration is breaking records. Hundreds of thousands have arrived at Europe's door this year. They climb into ramshackle boats in northern Africa, brave the dangers of the Mediterranean Sea, and then land in southern Europe, usually countries like Italy or Malta. If you see Africans here, it's because we all have one thing in mind. It's to cross the Mediterranean. Last month, we showed you the chaos unfolding in Italy, how thousands overwhelmed the island of Lampedusa. The migrant numbers have reduced since then, but they've not stopped. Now, if Said does not cooperate, chances are they will rise again. Europe knows this. The question is, what will they do about it? Will they fold under pressure? Will Europe let Said dictate the terms? We'll keep you posted as this story develops. The internet has got its knickers in a twist. Before I tell you why, let me ask you a question. What can you buy with 6,000 US dollars? A brand new car. What about multiple iPhones? You could even pay off mortgage. But have you thought about buying underpants? An Italian luxury brand has launched a pair of knickers. They're made of silk-lined wool. They're covered in sequins and they cost about 6,000 US dollars. They seem perfect for wealthy extroverts who are fond of perpetual discomfort. But for the rest of the world, they're simply bizarre. They cost about half the annual salary of an average Indian and about the same amount an average Briton spends on food in one year. But this is hardly the first oddity high fashion has showcased and it won't be the last. Here's a report. Sometimes fashion fills us with joy and other times it shocks us. But on some occasions, it simply leaves us wondering what in the world is going on here. This is one of those moments. We're talking about these knickers, which look more like knickknacks than a piece of clothing. They've been designed by Miu Miu, an Italian luxury brand. It's a high-end brand where the word high can be used both literally and figuratively. It's created these underpants out of silk-lined wool, then covered them in sequins, kind of like a disco ball voluntarily stuck to one's nether regions, or a summer vacation project by an over-enthusiastic child. But that's not even the shocking part. These underpants cost $5,600. Yes, about $6,000 for a pair of knickers. They seem ideal for any wealthy extrovert with a passion for being itchy. But if you aren't a strange knicker fanatic, this will simply scream bizarre. These underpants cost just as much as a brand new car. Their cost equals the annual salary of an average Indian. And they're the same amount an average Briton spends on food in a year. Now, you might say that this isn't the first time a pair of underpants have been priced ridiculously high. After all, in 2015, Queen Victoria's underwear sold for about $15,000 at an auction and went viral. This is strange too, no denying. Basic bloomers costing so much really makes one question their entire existence. But it's worth consolation that these bloomers are of historic significance. This doesn't necessarily fall in the same category as an oddity being passed off as a fashion trend and costing big bucks. But these Miu Miu knickers aren't alone in the abyss of weirdness. For the sake of examples, here are some other shockers. This hat, if you can call it that, is called Chapeau d'Amour. It costs about $3 million. 
These Balenciaga IKEA bags cost over $2,000. The lace-inspired bags by the same brand cost $1,500. And these fully destroyed sneakers by the same brand cost about $2,000. And their shoelace earrings cost about $300. This Moschino dress is made of plastic dry-cleaning bags and it's priced at over $700. This baguette bag by the same brand costs about $1,200. Jill Sanders paper bag costs about $300. And speaking of odd bags, these itty-bitty Jacques Mousse bags cost about $800. The list seems endless. And the point is, fashion can be weird. And more often than not, the industry takes this as a compliment. After all, fashion is an art. It's an expression of creativity. It aims to provoke an emotional response. And it's okay with getting under the viewer's skin. But that's not the only role fashion must play. There's a slight difference between art and fashion. It's not the same as a painting or a sculpture. It's a commodity. It needs to be worn. And it has to exist outside a gallery or a theatre. And while fashion may try to get under our skin and shift our thinking, does it have to cost thousands of dollars to do so? Especially when it doesn't necessarily fulfill a purpose. After all, a $5 pair of knickers with glued on sequins may do the job just as well. And now it's time for Vantage Shots, images that tell the story. There's a traffic jam at the Great Wall of China. Thousands visited the tourist attraction during China's national holiday leading to bottlenecks. In the UK, a massive fireball lit up the night sky in Oxfordshire. This was after lightning struck a waste processing facility. And you fancy owning Star Wars droid 3CPO's head. Well, you can buy it next month at an auction for $14.6 million. Other attractions at this auction include James Bond costumes and Harrison Ford's Indiana Jones bullwhip. Finally, we're taking you back in history on this day in 1990. East and West Germany reunited after 45 years. In 1945, Soviet forces occupied Eastern Germany, while the Allied forces occupied the western half of the nation. Divided Germany was one of the most enduring symbols of the Cold War. The unity of Germany came less than a year after the fall of the Berlin Wall. We're leaving you on that note. Thanks for watching. We'll see you tomorrow. Look at this. Yes, yes, yes. The cereal is very visual. Yeah, yeah. 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 yeah.